The Fan. Studio Guards in for Barrero today. I'll be in for at least the next couple of days. Brett Blakemore here for at least the next couple of days as well. Three hour tour for the rest of the week as we wrap up 2023 and shoot into 2024. Brad, Sean, Brian, KFN text line 64686. Might be temperamental today. Brett tells me it's not, maybe not working. I know my Twitter is at Guardsy. You can also hit booth at KFAN.com. A lot of ways to reach us, including the talk back. And we're glad that you're with us today. I'm back from Detroit, about 18, 19 hours in Detroit. I know everybody's happy for me. Just want to say real quick off the top before we talk Vikings, I'm glad that all of you out there, including you, Brett Blakemore, because I put you in this category. Okay. I'm glad that all of you have an outlet to tell everybody in your life (laughs) that you don't care about the quick lane bowl (laughs) and that you don't care about any of these bowl games. What would we do... If all of you out there couldn't scratch that itch to let everybody know that you think nothing is at stake, that you think the game is meaningless, and that you think the game is unwatchable. Can you imagine how many heads would explode if they couldn't get the tweet out, if they couldn't send the text, if they couldn't write the newspaper column, if they couldn't come on here and say, you know what sucks? Bull games. What would we do? Would we even make it to 2024? Or would it be a Y2K situation if all of you out there, you included, I'm in this, didn't have the ability to tell everybody you know that you're not interested in the college football games that are going on right now. I'm just glad that you have that outlet because I don't think any of you guys would survive. There's the salmon returning to Capistrano and then there's all of you telling us mid to late December that you don't care what's going on on the television screen or the apps, or your smartphones, or your connected devices, whatever it is from, what time was the game yesterday? 1 o'clock Central, essentially all the way through midnight, because that's what's happening every night now through the end of the year. College football from lunch to dinner to late night. But I'm just grateful, as I count my holiday blessings, meat sauce, that you have a spot to tell us, how much you think, how stupid you think the college football is. And by the way, I'm not even disagreeing with you. Bowls have never been more meaningless. They've never been more trivial. But that doesn't mean that they can't be fun. And that doesn't mean that they can't serve their purpose. And I'm just glad a couple of days after Christmas and a few days before we kick off yet another year that all of you had that ability to either tweet, text, talk, whatever it was, and get that off your chest. Because it's a very cool club you all belong to. The one that thinks college football in December is stupid. It's a very cool club. You guys are all so cool. I'm just glad I know you. I'm glad because you guys are cool. 
It's just cool to tell how how everything sucks. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. To, I'm glad to know all of you. Can you tell? Tell me how you really feel. I'm just Carson. glad. It just makes me feel warm that you guys can all. You know, I feel like it should just be a big group text that everybody just enters in, and you can all talk about how bad the football is. And trust me, college football is not always pretty. We watch NFL football every week. NFL football is not always pretty. As I've said a million times, if the NFL can't find ten good quarterbacks, what chance in hell? Does the Big Ten West have? We're here until 6. Johnny Athletic is at 3.30. Lou Nanny is at 4.15. And Pat Kessler, probably around 5. He'll probably hang for the entire final hour of the show. A lot to get to with Kessler. Why do I always tell you enjoy the season, Brett? Why? One reason, because sometimes you don't have a choice. (laughs) Sometimes you don't have a choice. And when you're thinking about the Minnesota Vikings this year, I would say that choice has been taken away from you. Last year, you had the choice. Were you going to enjoy 13-4? and four? Were you going to enjoy fourth-quarter comebacks? Were you going to enjoy Kirko Chains? Were you going to enjoy the biggest comeback in NFL history against the Indianapolis Colts? You had a choice last year. I hope this is a lesson for all of us, all of you, as I sermonize for a second time in the first six minutes of the show. This is why, in my opinion... When you have a choice to enjoy a season or not, as it's going, you take it. Because then, there's years where you are not afforded that option. You have no choice but to go, what draft pick can we get? Can we get into the top 10? Because the teams in front of us right now, I think if the season ended today, I think we'd pick 15th. Talking about, of course, your Minnesota Vikings. So, if we lost our next two, very likely... And the teams in front of us continue to win, very likely, because they're trying to get into the postseason. Why wouldn't you? Could we sneak ourselves into a top 10 pick? Those are the discussions that we're having right now. Sometimes your season is derailed by injuries. Your starting quarterback suffers a torn Achilles in week eight. Your best wide receiver misses seven games with a hamstring injury and a couple other games with various things, or at least most of other games. Your second-round pick this last year was a guy named TJ Hawkinson. Why was he your second-round pick? Because he traded a second-round pick for him. He didn't have one this year. He had TJ. He um, had an ear infection in training camp, wasn't available. Then his back was bothering him. Then he got like 50 mil, and all of a sudden he felt better. Well, he's out. It's over for him. Terrible injury for him. He might miss part of next season with an ACL and MCL injury. Same time, one of your defensive linemen, DJ Wanham, suffers a season-ending injury. You find a way to get your running game going. Alexander Madison had some fumble issues early in the season, actually has had fumble issues the entire season. So you make a shrewd move and and trade basically a meaningless draft pick for a guy named Cam Akers. And Cam Akers looks pretty good for a while. And you're wondering as you're doing, as you're you know looking at the game and you're going, okay, how do the Vikings game plan against this team? What do they do? You say, It'd be nice to see Cam Akers get some more run, get some touches. Well, guess what? Week nine, he's dead. He's meaningless. He's out with a torn Achilles. Anybody remember Marcus Davenport? I've gotten we've gotten that text to the Bradshaw Bryan KFN text line six four six eight six a lot. How come no one's talking about Marcus Davenport? I'll be honest. I think we all forgot he's on the team. He played like ten minutes. I think he's played one game. I think he had a sack. He was productive, but he's been meaningless. It's a season where Jordan Hicks, a remarkably important player on your defense, basically sat for a week with his legs split wide open on a rare injury called compartment syndrome. He missed four games, which four games for that, that's crazy. And he came back. Brian O'Neill, Alexander Madison, K.J. Osborne, Christian Derrissaw, Byron Murphy Jr., Ed Ingram. All players that have missed at least one game. Now, I'm not saying, like, this. none of this excuses what's been happening in these games. I mean, what Nick Mullins is doing with the football is absolutely preposterous. And that we're continuing, and I don't think they will. We might talk about that next segment. That they continue to trot him out as the best opportunity to win. I, I, I can't say I agree with that decision at this point. Unless you are trying to sneak into the top 10, and then all bets are off. Smoke him if you got him. But every team has injuries, but then there are some seasons. I mean, you lose your starting quarterback. We all knew it was going to be an uphill battle when Kirk went down in Lambeau. That's why it was so deflating. You want to to talk about the the yin and the yang of a season. A Josh Metellus interception 
with a quick strike, Kirk Cousins to Jordan Addison touchdown. I think on the next play, you're up 24-3. Lambeau Field is dead and quiet, and you have no idea where that sweatshirt is that you're wearing right now. You have no idea where it is because you were not even considering breaking it out. Is that fair to say? Back in whatever week that was. I had to dig for it afterwards. Yeah, Yeah, and now you've suddenly found it. That's shocking. Yeah, When it was 24-3, you had no idea where your Green Bay Packers sweatshirt was. Funny enough, I might actually lose it again (laughs) this weekend. It's possible. Might be gone. It's possible. So, but there's your season right there. He goes down. That, in a nutshell, is enough. But then you get it revived. All of a sudden, here comes the pasture knot. Your defense starts to play in a top-five manner. Like, you had some moments where it was fun, but let's be honest. I mean, this when, when Kirk went down, we all kind of knew the top end was out. But the last couple of weeks, even the victory, 3-0 against Vegas, I mean, this thing's going nowhere. So when you have the opportunity, they're not making the playoffs. I mean, and if they do, what are we doing? So Why not? Because we did the the season of perpetual hope last week. Yeah. The hope is gone. And I'm not even saying like Quazy should be fired or KOC should be fired. It just is what it is. It's just reality. And so I use it as a lesson. When you're given the option, when you have a choice on how you want to feel about a season, maybe you don't think everything's perfect. Maybe the wins aren't coming as easily as you'd want. Maybe you don't love everything about the team. But when you're given a choice and the team's running away with the division, and it's 13-4, and four, or it's a team going to the playoffs again with maybe a chip chair and a chance, I heartily recommend that you take it. Take the opportunity to enjoy it. If I have to say, that, that if, if that is the one thing in my, however long this radio career goes, I hope I impact one person to enjoy a season when given an opportunity. Because sometimes 2023 happens, and you're given no choice but to wonder, I wonder if Jaron Hall, will get the start, or Nick sure. Mullins for a border battle game that has postseason implications still, miraculously, believe it or not. We'll talk about that quarterback battle when we return. Jaron Hall or Nick Mullins? To me, the question se- or the answer seems pretty obvious. Hit the Bradshaw and Brian Cave and text line 64686. And remember, I'm very glad you can all tell me how stupid you think bowl games are. What the end, the fan. Follow the fan this football season on Twitter and Instagram, and you could win $100 in gas money thanks to your local Chevy dealers. One winner chosen every single Friday. It's brought to you by Select Heartland Chevy Dealers. Find new roads. Catch on Brian Cave in text line. Interesting, as you might expect. 64686. Hit me on Twitter as well at Guardsy. Johnny Athletics is going to join next segment. Brett Blakemore is here as well. Lou Nanny at 415 and Pat Kessler at 5 o'clock. A quick text from Andy. We get it. It's your job. But come on, man. You can't honestly say you were excited as a 5-7 and seven team to go to a no-name bowl. It's a stupid league where only 5-10 to 10 of the same teams every year have the only chance to get to a championship. I'm not going to say I was excited for the quick lane bowl. I had no, I had indifference about it. I have a job to do. I like my, doing my job. It's a fun job. I got another opportunity to do it. My point is, I didn't ask any of you to care. I'm not throwing it out there and going, you guys are stupid for not liking the quick lane bowl. You guys do whatever you want. Live your life. It's kind of my point in this whole thing. I just think it's funny that all of you out there have to tell all of us how stupid it is constantly. When there's a reason why there's 50 bowl games. People, including you. Two million people a couple of years ago watched the Belk Bowl. They probably are going to, I think they still have the Belk Bowl. So the point is, no, do I think anything substantial changed yesterday for Golden Gopher football? I don't. It was fun to see Darius Taylor play again because he's good. It's helpful to have a really good running back, especially when you're P.J. Fleck and you like to run the ball. Time for the Kiss PJ Flex Ass Hour. Yay, 218. I'm, uh, we're not going to talk about the Quick Lane Bowl. I was there. You watched it. I know all of you did. Or you listen to it, and that's fine. But I just don't get the itch that needs to be scratched to tell everybody else how crappy it is all the time. It's weird to me. Just don't watch. Just don't watch. You don't need to tell the rest of us. Just don't watch. Nick Mullins. It's been a good run. (laughs) 
I got. The, I understood what we were thinking. You're trying to save the season. You've got a veteran backup quarterback. You brought him in, I think, a year ago because he's got some talent. He went to the same college as Brett Favre, and they apparently text and talk more than people know. And at one point when he had a big moment for whatever team he played for before the Vikings, uh, he was on the NFL Network set, and Brett called in to talk about how proud he was. This was before we found out Brett was you know, siphoning millions of dollars from poor people in Mississippi to try to get a volleyball facility built for his daughter's volleyball team. This is before all that when Brett could still call in. The guy you were named after. Yeah, please say Brett Favre, <laughs> just for <the> future <laughs> reference. And so Nick Mullins, I get it. I understand you have a backup quarterback. He was injured when the Pasternot had to come in and Jaron Hall had to come in originally. I get all of that. But I think we've seen enough. I think we're done here. Because I just can't put a guy in that has no regard for valuing the football. In a season where that's saying something for the Vikings, where the entire season has been stained by turnovers from the one and three start to the most recent game. It's incredible when you think about it. Mullins became just the 16th quarterback in NFL history and the first since Jameis Winston to throw for 400 yards and four interceptions in the same game. Only the second Vikings QB to do that. Warren Moon did it back in 1994. Warren Moon also, I think, is a Hall of Famer and put up massive yards in, I think, first the USFL and then the National Football League, but we're done here. I mean, let's see what the kid can do now. I was I was on board with you know the the veteran, but what was funny about that is typically when you have a veteran backup quarterback, the rule is he's just not going to do anything to get you beat. He might not win the game for you, but he's not going to do anything to get you beat. Mullins is not only the exact opposite of that. It's like if you could paint the exact opposite picture of the pr- prototypical game manager, that's what Nick Mullins is, and you're going to ride the wave, man. We talked about it last week. It's a six-point ride at Nickelodeon Universe. It's not a three-point ride. The height requirement is straight up. It, it, if it's not 54 inches, it's 48. You've got to be four feet tall at least to ride this ride, chaperone or not, the Mullins roller coaster. It's preposterous. And when your default is, I'm getting sacked, I think I'll just drop the ball. Like, we're done here. We're, we're done. What are we doing? And the stupidity is some of these games were winnable. Some of it because of his positive play, I guess. But I got to feel like you can get the positive plays and the explosives that we are craving without the negative. And again, none of this really matters. The Vikings postseason uh, percentages, depending on who you believe right now, are between like 12 and 20 percent. They have essentially one shot to get in to be the seventh seed. Green Bay can sneak into the six, I think. Yeah. And this game... Saturday, or I should say Sunday on New Year's Eve, which is still 7.30 as as far as we know. The fan has learned. I think they're keeping it to oh uh, 7.20. Is, I love it. I'm a big, but I don't have to work the game. Well, are you, I'm going are, to the game. Well, that, But that's where I'm worried for your safety. For my safety? I'm worried for everybody's safety that's going to the game on New Year's Eve for a Vikings-Green Bay game. I'm just worried about, I mean, wear some rubber boots because the vomit quotient at the People <laughs> Stadium is going to be off the charts for a game like that. They so, should know to cut people off at like the third quarter. It doesn't matter. They're going to walk in that way. No, it's a yeah, 20 game. Yep, They've got yep, all day. You're right. There's nobody cutting you off in the tailgate lots. Yeah. There's nobody cutting you off before you hop on the light rail from the mall. It's every man and woman for himself on New Year's Eve. So if you're going, God bless you. And if you're bringing kids, don't. I'm telling you, it's going to be bad. And I'm not like being, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that's what it's going to be like. So. Can you tell I got in late last night from Detroit? You, you seem a little, little not as chippy as I, chipper yeah. as I usually am. Yeah. Chippy as opposed to chipper. Now, would you say what percentage of the vomit will be from Packers fans? Don't say 100. No, it can't be 100. I'm, I'm not naive enough to think it's 100. I mean, 60. 60. It depends oh, that's, on a, how, that's a fair it, number. It depends probably. on how many fans. Yeah. What's the percentage of their fans that show up? Because I'm assuming a lot of Packer fans are going to be here. On New Year's I Eve. I think it's a good bet. Yeah, so if it's a 50-50 crowd, I think they would still out-puke you know, 60 to 40. I think more puke per capita. It's more vomit per person. <laughs> Put that on a state sign. <laughs> I just think that's how yeah. it might roll. But it's time to see what Jaron Hall can do. We've yeah. been through it. We've seen, and it's no fault of anybody's here. This is the, the hand that they were dealt this year. It's why I opened the show after the quick lane bowl rant, talking about, When you have no choice, enjoy the season when you can. When Cousins went down, this was the stats would tell you this is the way that the season was going to go. 
Why do we remember Kurt Warner? Why do we remember Scott Mitchell? Why do we remember go down the list of random Case Keenum, backup quarterbacks that come in and go into magical seasons? We remember them because they're rare. If they happened all the time, we wouldn't remember them. And so when Cousins went down this season, it was always going to end like this. We always knew it was going to end like this. We enjoyed the pastor not ride. But the, the thing where, I mean, literally, how many times do we have to watch the quarterback just almost get sacked and then just drop the ball because I can't think of anything else. I'll just throw it. Turnover. It's just so careless. And that's just who he is. And I just think it's time to see what the fifth round pick from BYU can do and ride off into the sunset of 2023. So if you're admitting to, which I think is correct, that it was always going to end like this once Kirk went down, that was pretty much it. But the prevailing thought was we got to, you know, we can't just, we're a professional franchise. We can't just roll over yeah. and tank. We got to try and get something out of the season. Knowing that, what you just said, should they have just thrown in the towel and said, we're done? Here? No. And Alec Lewis wrote a really good piece on it in The Athletic that I read today where he essentially said, you can't, you, I, I, you always try. You always, you always try to put your best foot forward, in my opinion. Nick Mullins can't be your best foot forward this week. Like, there's just no way that he's your best foot forward, in my opinion. And once you have all these injuries that stack up, it's like they've gave it the old college try. I, I think it's actually worked out well for them and that they preserved the culture shield of this. <laughs> this is who we are. This is what we do. But at some point, it just becomes, I mean, look at this list. Cousins, Jefferson, Hawkinson, Wanham, Akers, Davenport, Hicks, you know, O'Neal, Madison, Osborne, Derisaw. I mean, Almost every single one of your important players at some point has missed time. In some cases, a lot of it. Like, at some point, you got to be realistic. Like, injuries do matter. Even KOC said it. You can say next man up all you want. You can talk about that man, that mentality, and we do live by that mentality because we like to prepare all of our guys. We may lose some of our more impactful players. We've got to continue to try to play to win football games. That's really what this whole year has been about. And that's true. Like, they have impacted him. And I'm not even saying they'd... They're packing it in now. To me, it's the percentages are so low. You, you can't put a guy in that had back-to-back weeks has multiple turnovers like this when the entire season has come down to that. And one of the reasons why you were in that position, even when Cousins was healthy, was because you couldn't stop turning the ball over. Like At some point, you got to draw the line and go, it's time to see what the kid can do. And we haven't even gotten into what do they do now the rest of – what do they do in the offseason? I mean, J.J. has been pretty vocal here a couple of times saying – I think we all see what Kirk means here and what a guy like that means. Does that sway everybody on how this decision goes? Does it sway the Vikings on how they move forward with number eight in Cousins Condos? Does it sway JJ on what he does in terms of an extension? There's a lot of open questions in that regard. Well, uh, ask some of those of our guy, John Krasinski, Johnny Athletic, Johnny New York Times, Johnny Clickbait, whatever you'd like to call him. Uh, he makes his weekly appearance on Bumper to Bumper. We'll review a Wolves loss last night in Oklahoma City. Talk about the Vikings and much more with our guy. KFAN, the fan. It's time for Johnny Athletic. Johnny Athletic. Johnny Athletic. And he's on the Dan Barrero right now. He's on the Connecticut Water System hotline. Barrero out. Guardsy in. Do not come at him with Matt Boldy. It's John Krasinski, Johnny Athletic, joining us now. How are you, my friend? I'm good, Garzi. How was the Motor City? It was wonderful. It was a wonderful yeah. 20 hours or so at the Quick Lane Bowl. Uh, Christmas night flight, get up early, go to Ford Field, do the game, get back last night late, and here I am, man. 24 hours, bowl season, nothing like it, as you know. Nothing like it. Did, did you see Lions fans swinging from <laughs> chandeliers and stuff still? Or there how, were a few. The vibe like? There were a few. The vibe is, there. it's festive there. The vibe is festive yeah. in Detroit. And why wouldn't it be? They've earned everything. They've earned all of it. They've done it the hard way. They're your division champs. And it's funny to see it, like, actually, ha- as you know, Johnny, I'm a veteran of the Quick Lane Bowl. This was my third yeah. Quick Lane Bowl. So I've been to Detroit multiple times. And it's the obviously the most excited I've sensed a city in just a short time that I've seen. So it was um, good for them because not so good around here for uh, for our local professional football club at the moment. Not great for, for them, but I, I did tweet out, like, I, I feel like their Wolves fans and Lions fans are kindred spirits. And you always like to see long-suffering fans who've put in the time, who've been kicked in the teeth, get rewarded. 
And Lions fans are getting that right now, which is very cool. And uh, maybe Wolves fans are going to piggyback off of that. We'll see. And let's start with the Wolves. Uh, I didn't see much of the game last night. I'm, I'm getting caught up on it, or I got caught up on some of it. And it really doesn't seem like there was a ton to get caught up on. It felt like one of those nights Oklahoma City was good, Wolves not very good. And the white flag was raised, I think, fairly early. But you hit on, I think, something interesting. In the few losses that the Wolves have had this season, just seven so far, there are some trends that are popping up. Um, I want everybody to go to The Athletic and subscribe, but if you could give us a little taste of what you wrote about today. Yeah, I mean, I do think that part of it, you look at last night, hey, they just made shots, right? And that's going to happen in a long season. There's going to be nights where you just don't have it. So you don't want to panic. You don't want to um, you know, overcorrect or do anything like that off of one game because I do think it was just one game, but there is a bit of a pattern with some of their losses that they've had. And that's when an opponent can sort of lure the wolves into a track meet. I think that is where this team just cannot keep up. So we've seen Oklahoma city do it last night. They hit 18 threes. They got out in transition and were running the first quarter. They shot 70%. The wolves shot 65%. And so you see that, and and we saw it with Sacramento back at in Target Center in November yep. when they hit a bunch of threes and, and just re- kind of turned it into an offensive kind of gangbusters party. And Atlanta even ran the Wolves out of the gym in the second half of that game. So um, I think that what we see is a team that if there is a weakness of the number one team in the West right now, it's that they cannot be a team that's going to win games 130 to 125. That's just not in their wheelhouse and so they have to be locked in defensively and 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 with the rotations and all those things to make sure that 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 their opponent's scoring stays down a little bit and keeps them you know in the low 100s and that's how that's how they're going to win games this season does it surprise you though that they can't really win games like that i know they're not the 2017 warriors but obviously carl great three-point shooter ant has his moments Nas had his moments Nas has had his moments mike conley you know that he was the only guy that really had it going last night and i know they can win like games like that it's not like they can't but it surprised me that i guess the offense hasn't been unlocked as much is it because they've put so much emphasis on the defensive side and it's just hard to do both? Or what's your theory on why it's been harder to unlock that side at times? Yeah, like you said, I mean, they have plenty of offensive talent. And so um, I do think that it has been kind of a season-long conundrum for them about why they haven't been able to get more out of the that side of the court. And they are 17th in the league in offensive efficiency right now. They've kind of hovered in 15 to 18, 19 for most of the season. And, and you do want to see some sort of continuity and, and more efficiency start to formulate here um, in the second part of the season as they, especially as they get down toward the playoffs, because, you know, their defense is great, but, but you need a little bit more offensively than what they've been given so far. And, and I think the one area that you look at about why that is happening um, there's several, but uh, but this is a team that does not shoot many threes. They shoot a great percentage. I think they're seventh in the league in three point percentage, but they are 24th in attempts, and they just don't have a lot of volume three point shooters. So when Oklahoma City last night, when Lou Dort is hitting everything he throws up, when Chet Holmgren's knocking him down, when 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 those things are happening um, at a at a high rate. The Wolves don't have a whole lot of guys that are going to get out there and just hit a bunch of them. Conley did last night. I'd like to see Carl Anthony Towns shoot more than two yep. in, a, in a game like like last night. Um, they, they, I think that there's room for improvement there. But they also may need to look at, at as the trade dine, deadline gets closer, bringing in someone who can breathe a little bit of more spacing into this offense because Kyle Anderson isn't shooting well right now. Rudy is not a shooter. Um, you know, Nas is kind of streaky. They have a few other guys that, that are up and down with it, but they need, they need a Malik Beasley type kind of a flamethrower to come in there and really keep defenses honest because when they're not hitting at a high rate, uh, it's harder for them to really kind of keep up with offenses that are. Well, somebody uh, wrote in, was Torian Prince interested in re-signing or was he leaving no matter <laughs> what? Because it looks like he makes less than Shake Milton. And he's dearly yeah, beloved. Well, Didn't he make eight threes at the Garden last year? 
Yeah, yeah. No, he, he definitely is missed, um, for sure, because he was one of their best three-point shooters and certainly another guy who just jacks them up, who gets gets a bunch up in the minutes that he is allocated. I do think that um, the Wolves ma- sort of made the decision this summer that uh, they needed more backcourt help than they did um, swing men, wing guys like three fours, like princes. They figured that they'd be okay with, with Alexander Walker, with um, Jaden McDaniels, with Nas Reed uh, in, in the front court there that, they were willing to let Prince go because they went and got Shake Milton thinking that he would be the bucket getter in that second unit in the backcourt. Obviously, he has not worked out yet to this point. Um, just doesn't seem to have the confidence, doesn't ha- hasn't found a rhythm. And that is a player that if they could somehow ignite him, it would make a huge difference with that second unit. But yes, essentially they chose Shake Milton as a – as a um, kind of playmaker, uh, scorer off the bench over Torian Prince. And so far, that decision uh, hasn't hasn't panned out very well yet. Johnny Athletic on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline talking Wolves. We'll talk Vikings with Johnny Athletic as well. Cat got a tech last night. It's been rescinded today, if I read all the uh, the updates on it correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, have we seen enough through the first you know 30-ish games to believe – that he's that this difference in him is sustainable where he's essentially been one of the most even handed, even keeled guys and consistent performers for this club on a night out night night in basis. Yeah, I mean I you know, I guess you still after watching eight years of it, you want to see maybe more than twenty six, twenty seven games right. uh, of sample size. But it has been this has been, I would say, the most sustained his composure has been since I can remember. And it was to the point guards who were last night when he got the technical, which did not, at the time I was watching and I did not see anything that merited a technical, but he did get it. Uh, It was surprising. And, you know, we we are so used to Hmm. Carl and even Ant as well, really picking up a lot of P's and arguing with the officials a lot. But Towns has really been good about that. Now, he did not play well last night, five turnovers, he looked sluggish, you know, after missing a game with a sore knee, right? And just it wasn't moving like himself. But um, he did not. It, his struggles last night were not of the variety that we have seen in the past, where he does get flustered, he gets in his own head, he he is arguing with officials and letting that kind of take him out of the game. He just was a little slow physically last night. So um, all in all, for Carl Anthony Towns, it's been a huge improvement for him in just the way that he is going about his business on the court. And I don't think it is a coincidence that as that composure has come, so are we seeing the most impactful stretch of his career in terms of both ends of the court and what he is doing, helping the Timberwolves win games and not just piling up stats. It's been really, really good for him. Is it fair for me to wonder why Anthony Edwards doesn't get the same scrutiny from fans <laughs> on the officials? Because it's, I I promise that it, I, I don't think he's ever gotten a call when he's yelled, Hey, I, I, that's just me yeah. anecdotally. And he does it constantly, Johnny. And it really, <laughs> yeah. it really bothers me. So, and I know he's younger and he hasn't been around and he's been a part of winning, yeah. which cat wasn't for the first yeah. five or six years. But what do we make of that difference? No, the, there's definitely a double standard in the way that fans uh, interpret and receive Anthony Edwards versus Carl Anthony Towns. And I've said this, I said it last year as well, uh, whether it is because Ant is kind of the shiny new toy and doesn't have sort of the stench of dysfunction <laughs> on him that Carl Anthony Towns carries with him from all of the stuff that he's been around for, whether it's maybe Ant just is a little more, uh, just has a different personality in terms of his interviews and his vibe that way. But I've always thought it was unfair because, um, you know, Carl Anthony Towns is ultra efficient, um, you know, and, and his game even last year was so much more reliable than Anthony Edwards. Now, Anthony Edwards, more dynamic, um, does has, has shown up more in the clutch and in the playoffs than Carl Anthony towns. But, um, but I do think it has been unfair at times that cat 
has every single interview that he does or every interaction with the official just really scrutinized by, you know, haters and and gets away with some a, a lot more of it. So um, that I, I totally agree with you there that um, it, it's it's a it's a double standard that does not make a whole lot of sense to me. But uh, but I, I guess uh, fans can make up their minds and, and have their favorites and, and, and do it the way that that they want to. Well, including for me, legitimate off court issues. You know, whether it was sure. last year with the video or this year with what you know just popped out with the Instagram model. Like and again, mm-hmm. he's he's younger and I'm not excusing yeah. everything, but like that stuff I think has to change in the next few years. I mean that because that I mean that can not that any one thing is is a problem, but that stuff adds up mm-hmm. after a while. So that's what's interesting is he kind of rolls through that as well. And it's the which is I'm not saying he should or shouldn't, I'm just saying it's it's an interesting observation when everything it seems that Carl does is scrutinized and he's done nothing um, to rise to that level. That's, I mean, it's a great point, Garzi. Um, you know, once we all, I think a lot of fans like to say, man, if only Cat was as, you know, ha- ha- as genuine as, as Ant is in the, in his interactions, or if only he had, kind of the, the the taste for the jugular that Ant does in playoffs and all those things. Uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, Ant could learn from Carl in the way that he conducts himself off the court. Um, you know, one thing that is clear right now is Edwards is ascending to a plane uh, in the stratosphere that is above even a franchise player, right, where right. it is possible he can be face of the league type player, and and he you know he's one of the very best American players in the league right now. There are opportunities for him that are going to be above and beyond what Cat has ever had, what Kevin Love has ever had, anything anyone remotely close to a franchise player here. But that does bring a level of scrutiny and an expectation of professionalism off the court that is on another level. And these things that Ant has gone through the last couple of, uh, of years now are going to have to be cleaned up. And one thing that you have never had to worry about with Carl Anthony Towns in nine years here has been him embarrassing himself or the organization off of the court with any kind of actions or you know, what he's said or behaviors or anything like that. So I think that Cat, you know, could help Ant if Ant is willing to kind of listen to that and just how how much it how important it is for, for Carl Anthony Towns to have an image right uh that that is out there, that is respectable and those those are those would be good things for those two guys to talk about because they are very close. They get along well. And I think it could help both people. Yeah, and I, I didn't mean to make this Carl versus Ant, but I got in late from the Quick yeah. Lane Bowl last night, and you know things happen. Here's one last text on it, 64686. It's not hard to know why fans get more angry with Cat about officials than they do with Ant. Ant performs in the playoffs. Cat isn't on the floor because of his fouls. I'll just say this. Like you said, Johnny, don't come at me with Matt Boldy. Watch the playing yep. game against the Lakers last year. Carl was the best yes. player on the floor, and Ant was a complete no-show. And again, it's one game, but the point is, it happens to everybody. Like, if Ant showed yep. up at all, the the Lake, the Lake Wolves were the seven and might have had a good yep. matchup instead of having to play Denver. Like, it happens to all of them. They're all trying to figure this out. So I didn't want to make it Ant versus Carl, but I think that's a good example right there. It's like Carl was brilliant against the Lakers, and Ant was nowhere to be yep. found. And then it flipped again in Denver. Or against Denver. Yep. And, well, but I would say even Carl, outside of game one against Denver, was really, really good yeah. in that series, especially defensively against Jokic. And and so there are just people that are blinded by whatever irrational hate they have for Carl. And some of it is deserved. Some of it, you know, some of the things that he says on podcasts or some of the lack of success right. has, you know, has been that way. But um, but I do think that it, it does border on on just completely detached from reality with, with some of the things that are that are said just like that last message to you. All right. Well, bo- we're good. We're both in cats. Will. I'm also in PJs from <laughs> some stuff earlier. Yeah. So I'm good. I'm set. I feel good about my generational money here um, that I <laughs> that I've got that I've got rolling a couple more wolves things before we talk some Vikings next segment. So what? What are the other main stories in the West? It seems obvious that the Wolves are the story. It's been funny, and you and I have talked about it, and I talked about it last week. 
Like if you just woke up out of if you if you if you came out of um, you know frozen crevasse last week and heard Bill Simmons telling everybody that the Wolves are a Finals <laughs> team, you'd, wa- right. you'd wonder what's where you were. Right? It's it's some yeah. heady stuff that's being said about the Wolves. So your reaction to that, first of all, but also what are the other stories in the West as we try to you know sift all this stuff out now that we're past Christmas? Yeah, I mean it it has been pretty incredible to watch. You know, just how people are speaking with assuredness that the Wolves are going to be, you know, right in this all the way to the end. And, and, and a real possible finals team like Simmons, like Rosillo, who I both have my love, by the way. I think they're great. Agree. Uh, listens. I, 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 I listen every time to everything that they have to say. But, um, the, the, the sort of correction now to how quickly that the thing that always bothered me about the, the stuff last year, Garzi, was just how quickly everyone wanted to immediately bury everything. And it's just like you needed to give this some time. And, and now it's come out and it's looking pretty good. And so you, you look at the way that the Wolves are being uh, dissected and analyzed that way, and then they're number one in power rankings, they're, they're this and that. It's, it's been wild to, to kind of see how quickly it <laughs> yeah. has turned. And you look in the West, and that's, I think, part of it here, too, Garzi, is, you know, Oklahoma City, I think, is really good. Denver looks great again. They're starting to find their way. Yep. Um, but there's no teams there that say that you look at and you say the Wolves have no shot against these guys. Uh, Phoenix looks really bad right now. The Clippers, eh. You know, who knows what's going to happen with that? I don't trust that over the long term. Right. Um, Golden State struggling. So um, there, there are the, the door seems to be open for this Wolves team in the West because I love the matchups against so many of these teams and the way that they can they can counteract things that that other teams can do. And so uh, we have not seen any other team really emerge. Dallas looks OK some nights and, and not Lakers. Uh, not so much. And so the, the, it's wide open right now for the Wolves. And I think that's why, in part, why you're seeing so many people start to say, yeah, they can do this. Like, this is possible. And to, to say those words and to hear those words said, not ironically, not sarcastically, right. um, it's it's been unbelievable so far. The ironic, one of the I- ironic parts for me is that they've, the, the conversation has shifted so much to saying, nobody can match up with the Wolves' size and you have yeah. to, and you have to have size in the NBA when it was just a year and a half ago and I played I did kind of a yin and yang of a year ago that's how sick I am Johnny last week I played yeah Simmons and Rosillo after the trade yeah. <laughs> I yeah. play, and I, and not like a lot of it cuz you know they're swearing and stuff and again I love those guys but I, but the way yeah. I phrased it was every conversation I heard a year ago and I was on the RV trip, as you know. I listened to you on the Low Post yes. Pod when you had your your nephew's uh, video game headset to do the podcast <laughs> right. because it was right. Fourth of July. Like I listened to every piece of content I could on that <laughs> trade, and all of them said they overpaid. The price was ridiculous, but this is going to make them a top four seed. And as we say, yeah. Friday nights at nine thirty on Fox Nine and seven thirty on Fox Nine Plus. Enough said. Tap me on the shoulder yeah. when that's been the case for the Wolves. So it's just been interesting to to see it now come to fruition where whatever, obviously, when everybody's healthy and they're all playing, this is a top four seed. And that, I think, is what's mm-hmm. been the fun part about it is those of us that maybe wanted to slow roll it a little bit and not immediately hate on everything have said, okay, this, is, this can work. And now it's teams that can't play with them. Like title contenders now, it's, I don't think they have enough size. I mean, the whole thing was Rudy's going to get played off the court in the playoffs. Uh, Carl can't guard that position. And now it's like... You have to have size to compete in the NBA, and if you don't have a couple of bigs, you're dead. It, it seemed to change quickly. It's uh, you know, it's what I kind of said from the beginning. As soon as it was, it was the trade was consummated, and yeah, I will admit, like I had a hard time wrapping my mind around it. And even last year, I was underwhelmed by what I saw, especially early on in the season. But I never sure. thought that it was an absolute disaster because one big reason that is also unique to this point in Timberwolves history versus the past is Tim Connolly and Chris Finch are two very, very smart and capable leaders as coach and GM of this franchise. And so if they really believed in this, I have to look at that and say, I think these guys know what they're talking about. 
you know, there's been plenty of guys in those positions in the, in the Wolves organization over the years where you have skepticism about it, where you don't give them the benefit of the doubt. But these guys are really sharp. And Tim Connolly knew that the Denver Nuggets were the best team in the West. And to beat them, you have to be big. And that's what he wanted to do. And one of the reasons that last year was not the abject disaster that, that a lot of people wanted to paint it as was because the Wolves got into the playoffs. Can you imagine if they had not made the deal and they missed the playoffs, which they would have missed the playoffs had they not made the Rudy deal. Right. And then because it would have been being all, out. well, the Timberwolves can't put a winner around Ant. He's going to want out of here. Right. And, and so those are the kinds of things that all factor into how you have to evaluate this organization, that trade. I understand not being you know, fully on board last year with everything that you saw, but I just wanted to see more time. And so far, so good. They haven't, we don't, there's no parade route yet. They haven't hung any banners. Correct. But you are at least seeing the logic behind it and why they did it. And off they go here. And that's why you have a spot on Run It Back Island with me, with Max yes. Fuller, and with Craig Kilborn. There's only four of us, and <laughs> you're there, and a couple of others, but you, you were there on Run It Back Island, so we appreciate your patronage. Uh, I'll put Johnny on hold. We've got some Viking stuff to discuss, including who he thinks should start in the border battle on New Year's Eve. All of that coming up with John